Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, although I was presented as being from Ukraine, indeed I'm working and living in Ukraine, but uh, I'll tell about the experience of uh, adoption of anti-discrimination legislation in Moldova since I'm a Moldovan myself and I was uh, living until uh, uh, recent, until three years ago I was living in Moldova and uh, doing actually the parallel monitoring of the implementation of the visa liberalization action plan uh, in Moldova. So basically, uh, as you understand, I'm not a person who is dealing with the uh, anti-discrimination issues on the daily basis. It's not my uh, it's not my main uh, area of uh, of uh, competence of research. I'm mostly dealing with the uh, issues related to European integration. So. Um, Basically, as you might uh, have been, uh, you, you you might have known that uh, Moldova already has the visa liberalization in place. So I lost my job in Moldova. Therefore, I moved to Ukraine. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, I will try to explain from the perspective uh, of a civil society person who was not directly involved in the adoption, however, was in, directly involved in monitoring and in, uh, in uh, the, let's say, in all the bodies that uh, were uh, convening, were, were gathering on the issue of visa liberalization. And uh, I was part of the task force, the governmental task force on visa liberalization, and therefore I am quite familiar with this issue as a as a person who was able to monitor all these uh, activities um, and i will start my presentation with uh, with a conclusion that uh, visualization was a very powerful tool and is still a very powerful tool uh, because i don't think that the anti-discrimination uh, law would have been adopted if uh, uh, Moldova would have not uh, uh, didn't have a, a visa liberalization action plan, and uh, basically it was the reward, but uh, the the possibility of uh, free movement in the Schengen countries that made uh, politicians to take serious uh, the issue of the issues laid out in the in the action plan, and um, I would divide the process in two uh, stages, not as it is divided in, uh, in the official way, first phase, like the adoption of legislation, and second phase, the implementation, but uh, rather from the, I would divide it in technical and political. Technical, uh, these are all the related issue with standards, with border management, with, you know, what does not uh, endanger the political base of the incumbents. And the political was uh, the anti-corruption legislation and anti-discrimination, of course, legislation. Basically, in Moldova, until the adoption of the law, which happened in 2012, um, the law was being discussed for already four years. So it was the initiation was in 2008, and it was adopted in 2012 with uh, several times sending it to parliament and then back to the government and then again to the parliament and so on and so on. So it was a process of uh, clear non-determination from the political class to adopt this legislation. And I remember how uh, every time the law was passed from the government to the parliament, there was a mass protest, for instance, of the church. Uh, in uh, front of uh, the government or in front of the, uh, well, basically uh, holding press conferences and so on and so on, but they will protest against this satanic law, as some, some have called it, well, in a different way. Uh, and uh, there was a very, very strong lobby from the side of, uh, of the church, uh, even the patriarch of uh, Russia uh, have visited Moldova and tried to lobby the uh, non-adoption of the anti-discrimination law. So it was a very uh, strong campaign, I would say. But then <clears throat> the government, uh, the political parties uh, had initially, when we started to talk uh, with, with the political parties in Moldova about the adoption of anti-discrimination law, uh, we said, look, it's, uh, it is a 
a mandatory law that has to be adopted. Um, and then they said, look, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's there somewhere in the plan, but actually, you know, Macedonia made it with the visa liberalization, but they didn't adopt the law. So, and then we said, because we already were in touch with, for instance, with European Stability Initiative, if you might, you might be familiar with such think tank uh, in the Balkans, uh, they, they work a lot in the Balkans, uh, who have done this project White Schengen List, and they have a wide knowledge on the Balkans about the visualization process. So basically, and they told us that uh, EU is not going to uh, repeat the same mistakes uh, in the Eastern Partnership countries, because if for the Balkan countries uh, this was not a mandatory, but it was a recommendation, then of course they didn't, didn't do, uh, they, they, they do not implement recommendations. They implement only mandatory things. And then it appeared to be a problem because uh, as we saw the issue, uh, the anti-discrimination is needed not, f not only for the uh, countries where the legislation is adopted. Of course, these countries, first of all, need this legislation and this mechanism to defend against uh, discrimination. Uh, but, uh, also in, but also EU countries and EU needs uh, the anti-discrimination uh, mechanism to work in these countries because when a, a person applies for asylum, uh, if the, orig uh, the country uh, where this person is originating does not have uh, legislation on anti-discrimination in place, then EU is, in a way, most likely obliged to uh, grant uh, asylum uh, to, uh, this, uh, to this person. So it was also a defense mechanism for the EU itself, and I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, logical, and it's, it's quite okay to be like that. Um, so in Moldova, the, the opposition of the political parties towards this law was mostly from the perspective that it provides also uh, a mechanism of protection for the, uh, for the uh, sexual minorities. <laughs> And of course, this was the biggest issue because they said, "Like, look, we are okay to adopt it, but without the mention on sexual minorities. Let's put it like this: uh, religious, ethnic, and uh, etc." And they said, uh, "Well, it doesn't work like this because then uh, the uh, ju uh, the judiciary might uh, can interpret, and it's it's a very discretionary, I mean, way because someone." can interpret that etc. Et means also sexual minorities, someone cannot. So basically, um, then we understood that uh, the civil society is really needed, uh, really needs, uh, the political parties really need the support of civil society because what politicians uh, did, what uh, the government did and uh, political parties in, in, uh, in, uh, in power, they said to us, look, I mean, this is a very controversial issue for us. We understand that uh, we need to adopt it because of visa position, but we will lose our political support. So would you like to do advocacy for this? And we will say, like, well, we are pressured by the civil society, so we need to adopt it. Basically, it was a little bit uh, like, uh, like, you know, a little bit of uh, theater in a way. Um, and uh, of course, we were quite willing to help, but uh, we were at the same time very... Um, disturbed by the fact that uh, government tries to engage civil society when only the government needs, basically. When civil society asks for something from the government, for instance, you know, um, transparency of uh, uh, political party funding, when the, the government is not willing to talk to civil society. But when government wants something, as it was the anti-discrimination law, of course, then it was very willing to cooperate with civil society, and I think it's, this was a good example of cooperation. So, uh, when the anti-discrimination law was passed, it was created the Anti-Discrimination Council. We have a member, by the way, of the Anti-Discrimination Council here in the room. <laughs> so, uh, basically, uh, the Anti-Discrimination Council, it took a while to become operational. And uh, yeah, since October 2003, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 2013, I'm sorry, uh, when uh, the Anti-Discrimination Council uh, became uh, operational, uh, until uh, this moment there was filled, uh, I think, more than 200 uh, uh, complaints. 
And uh, surprisingly, uh, most of the people thought that these complaints would be related to somehow to uh, sexual minorities. And it was surprisingly for all of them, it is not related to sexual minorities. It's related mostly of them to uh, people who complain about not having access to public goods or to justice. And most of these complaints are filled by the people with special needs, basically. So uh, that was an important uh, example that uh, anti-discrimination law was needed because the argument behind those who were opposing the anti-discrimination legislation was that, look, I mean, we don't have complaints now, therefore we don't need this legislation. And what we were trying to say that when you have a mechanism for comp uh, for uh, uh, to compl um, to, to submit, actually, complaints, then you will have complaints because you don't have now because there is no mechanism. So why, why should someone complain if there is no mechanism? So basically, this was proved by the, by the uh, uh, example of uh, existing of this anti-discrimination council. However, I have to, uh, to mention, and maybe Andre, of course, he is in, in, in a member of the Anti-Discrimination Council and will um, likely tell more about how it functions, but as an observer of this mechanism, I would say that it's uh, quite uh, weak in terms of powers. Uh, it's quite active. It's very... Uh, the, the members of this Anti-Discrimination Council are very um, uh, competent. But uh, the legislation does not uh, give them uh, um, uh, the competences which such bodies should have. So it can apply fines, for instance, but it cannot uh, implement them, or how to say, it can adopt decisions, but it cannot implement them. And it cannot force someone to implement their decisions. So basically, there is some, uh, um, I think it should be, uh, this anti-discrimination uh, council should be upgraded and uh, apparently this is not going to happen very soon, but uh, I think it's a task for, for homework. So basically when I <coughs> explain, uh, you know, in terms of anti-discrimination uh, to someone who is not very familiar with the issue, I say like, you know, it's, uh, it's like the, the, the case which happened in 1990 uh, when uh, in Russia, there was a financial collapse. You might uh, remember this in 1999. Yes, and uh, the IMF um, uh, representative came to Eltsin and asked, uh, look, I mean, do you, what, what, can you tell me what is the situation in one word? And Yeltsin looked at him and said, in one word? Yes, in one word. Good. And in two words, not good. You know, so it's, it's the same with the Anti-Discrimination Council So in Moldova. It's in one word is good, but in two words is not good. Because we use, we have uh, like the basic uh, standards, we meet the basic standards, but at the same time uh, we are not uh, yet capable to upgrade these uh, standards in order to, uh, to create more uh, to give more power to, to this body, and I think that uh, anti -disc uh, the discrimination in Moldova exists in um, almost all of the areas, and um, basically uh, there is a progress, of course, there is a fight, uh, but uh, it will take um, much more until this uh, problem will be uh, will become marginal, let's say. Uh, I think I can stop here. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I told you the experience, how I saw it during the, and purely from the perspective of the visa liberalization uh, process, because that is what I, what I was doing. So, uh, yeah, basically I would be happy to discuss uh, any questions. Thank you very much for the two presentations. And uh, I think we already have a lot of questions and it was a good introduction of the situation now. My first question, because of my background uh, yeah. uh, as well. So the first question I have that, okay, we heard the story, but what are the so-called national minorities in this story uh, in the region and mainly in the Visegrad countries? When we refer to ethnic minorities, they usually say national minorities. So my question that we looked at the civil society groups uh, even playing the 
the scenario with the government pushing for anti-discrimination, we would say that in countries like Moldova, 21% of uh, the population made of uh, national minorities. Where were they? What was their perspective? Whether they were active, whether they were supportive, whether they participated in in this movement? I'm asking both countries, um, what was the perception and what was the acti level of activity? Uh, well, with the ethnic minorities, um, it's quite difficult to assess because this is highly, uh, this is an issue highly entangled with the political uh, process. First of all, uh, my personal assessment is that uh, in Moldova quite often the rights of majority are discriminated. And I'll explain why, because uh, uh, for instance in terms of uh, the uh, issue of language is an issue. Uh, the Russian language, uh, although represents about 7% uh, of uh, the ethnics uh, in Moldova are Russians. We have 7% Russians, uh, 11 uh, Ukrainians, and uh, other smaller groups. Uh, the Russian language is widely used in many regions uh, as a language of so-called inter-ethnic communication. And it's quite often when uh, uh, the majority, or how to say representative, the um, Moldovan speaking Romanian language is not able to use uh, its own language to communicate in certain regions. Uh, this is a problem. Northern Moldova, Southern Moldova region of Kagauzia, for instance, and so on. Basically, uh, this is an, not very typical story in a way. Um, also, the tensions which are uh, with the, some ethnic minorities are related again to the political process. The division, if you would uh, look at the division and the arguments of why certain uh, ethnic minorities consider themselves uh, not respected enough, as they say, or discriminated is because of some political issues. For instance, in Gagauz region, which is a uh, um, which are people of Turkic uh, origin, but who are Christians. So this is a special blend of of uh, Turkish, uh, uh, in a way, people. Uh, they say uh, that they feel themselves discriminated because Moldova is pursuing the uh, path of European integration, because their will is to join the uh, Russian-led. Uh, Customs Union. So this is, uh, well, this is a very, in a way, uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, remnant of, uh, of the, the country. We, uh, we notice uh, the, same, the same things in Ukraine. We notice the same things, maybe less in Georgia, but in Ukraine certainly. Uh, so basically, uh, these are the key uh, problems. While in Moldova you have Unlike, I think, unlike in Ukraine, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, Moldova, you have the Bureau for Inter-Ethnic Relations, which is a governmental body, uh, and the uh, head of this bureau is appointed by the uh, government as well, uh, which is a sort of uh, hub for all the ethnic minorities to interact. They try to defend uh, themselves in terms of legislation. Uh, usually, again, I say usually this uh, bureau is highly russified in a way because it's not, uh, it's not proportional to the situation which you have within the country. But anyway, it's good that it exists, although the budget, I recently learned that the budget of the bureau for uh, one year is about uh, $20,000 per year. So you can imagine what, what this bureau can do actually. So this is the budget only for some few salaries, and that's it, uh, basically. So uh, there, is, there is a problem. Now uh, I wanted to mention one thing on the religious uh, minority, if you, if you allow me. We had a very sound case. We had two sound cases in Moldova on religious minorities. First is with the, the most of the churches, and the church in Moldova is subordinated to the Russian Patriarchate, and it's called uh, uh, the Moldovan Church. Uh, an, al an alternative was created with the so-called Bessarabian Church, which is subordinated to Romanian Patriarchate. 
and uh, uh, the Moldovan authorities refused many years in row to many years in line to uh, register the Bessarabian uh, church because they said look it's not we have already one church we don't need it and then uh, it was the European Court for Human Rights decision to register this uh, church and it was registered and the second issue uh, which is uh, more recent it happened in 2011 before even the adoption of anti-discrimination law uh, when the Ministry of Justice registered the Islamic League in Moldova we have about 17,000 uh, people who are uh, who con consider themselves Muslims uh, and uh, basically the Islamic League was uh, registered of Islamic League was uh, delayed for several years and then in 2011 it was registered and it was a big big problem big protest big hysteria basically by the Orthodox Church that this would cre create as they say they will see an alternative and might they might choose the wrong religion as they say they, they said well, which is uh, an argument I, I can't understand this this kind of arguments but anyway they said this and then they even tried to uh, pressure the Ministry of Justice who is currently by the way the head of constitutional court who said if we don't register the, uh, the Islamic League we will end up with another condemnation in the European Court of Human Rights so it's better that we do it now without being condemned for this well I would say that uh, Again, I don't, my impression during the four years time since I worked on visa liberalization action plan implementation was that the minorities were not really involved in the process. Uh, and the representatives of, uh, let's say, organization of ethnic minorities, we have different uh, organization of ethnic minorities, were not really involved in the process. That was my, my uh, feeling. And uh, one explanation is that uh, uh, in Moldova, the uh, o good organization of uh, uh, this uh, um, association of uh, various uh, ethnic minorities is very active in cultural uh, areas. So they create, they uh, organize these festivals of national music, of national food, and so on. So in these areas, they are very uh, active. While in terms of defending their certain rights, I would say uh, not very active. Uh, and uh, usually because is, this is because uh, quite often they see their defender in, in name of certain political parties. For instance, it is well known that the party of uh, Ravna Pravi and Moldova is representing the Russian minority. The party, you know, uh, National Liberal Party is representing the Romanian, and so on and so on. Basically, they they see themselves rather in terms of uh, in terms of uh, as their defender in terms of political party. Uh, sometimes when the uh, institutionalization of uh, certain groups is very weak. The EU was stepping in. For instance, if you would look at the fourth block of the visa liberalization action plan, you would see that the EU was requesting a plan to deal with the Roma minority. Uh, and the government adopted a plan to deal with Roma minority, uh, an action plan to deal with Roma minority, in order to integrate better them uh, into the, uh, well, Moldovan affairs, uh, uh, but also in order to, uh, but also we introduced the so-called mechanism of mediator, public mediator, which, uh, community mediator, thank you, I did not find the proper translation, community mediator, uh, which was uh, uh, also helping in a way, well, they don't have money for, for, for this now, as, as, I, as I remember, uh, as the usual problem, but it, it was recommended as a very good mechanism in order to integrate certain minorities which are quite uh, which are quite isolated or isolate themselves quite seriously to integrate them in the broader community okay thank you very much uh, i would like to open uh, and address the question uh, to our colleagues from ukraine that whether it was the same situation or is it the same situation regarding the level of involvement of national minorities into the anti-discrimination law drafting negotiation and the entire process 
Thanks, Sophia. Uh, I will not tell you, you with the whole story behind anti-discrimination legislation in Ukraine. It was more or less similar to Moldovan and Georgian experience, at least in that part that it was pushed by European Union. And we have to thank for the whole process, for this visa liberalization promise to have the legislation in Ukraine. But uh, unfortunately, no one was involved in a process of drafting because it was not transparent and open. It was Ministry of Justice work overnight. And then it was registered in a parliament so without any attempt to discuss this with the civil society. It was rather the process of commenting it later after the first law was adopted. And national minority NGOs, well, to a certain extent, were involved, not so much religious minorities. But now, if you look at the statistic that is provided uh, by National Equality Body, which is Ombudsman in Ukraine as well, we see that it's mostly religious uh, complaints that are coming. Out of uh, almost 500 complaints last year, um, it's 154 complaints on the religious discrimination. Uh, slightly less complaints on uh, ethnic uh, or racial discrimination and just one complaint uh, coming from uh, LGBT person. Uh, we had the same concern uh, and same protests from church and other actors saying that uh, it's not Ukraine and uh, that needs this, uh, this law, not national or religious minorities, but just these uh, LGBT people and you're behind them. So uh, I'd say that uh, the main issue is uh, for years, uh, since that's the practice we keep since uh, Soviet Union, we had um, perception that minorities uh, in a country, what they need are festivals, music and food, and that's it. They've been tr trained to expect that kind of support from the state. And it was the, the practice that U Ukraine inherited and accomplished for, for 22 years, just giving money for festivals. I'm not talking about what is uh, minority rights, uh, what is integration process. Uh, so people expected this from state and still expect these kinds of support. And they do some t many of them do not understand what are minority rights, what to, to demand. And when they start, they see that the state is not ready to provide it to them. We are not talking about inclusion. We are not talking about integration. We are not talking about representation in the political process. And that's the reason behind not using anti-discrimination legislation. But uh, I will not. I will stop here because there are many, many things uh, around this law in Ukraine, and not not just around the law, but the the implementation process. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was quite a straightforward answer to my question. Um, the next question that came to my mind, and I'm going to ask you all that uh, you said that you reached the basic basic standard and now you are expecting to move on so my question would be what are the next steps you are expecting you also criticized the eu a bit saying that uh, they request only public awareness raising and a bit of training for the public officials so what do you see what is the, what are the next step on your on in your opinion but before we go to this uh, this question. I would like to ask uh, the Visegrad countries, one, one of them who are in the room, that when is the moment when you, you have the basic standard and then you move on and you move forward? So when, when is the moment, at what, how much time they need to wait for reaching at the point when you are more or less satisfied with the system you have and more or less you have what you need to have? So give, give them some promises or, or not. <laughs> um, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, the Sharka or Kalman or, yeah. Hello, um, I'm from Visegrad country. I'm from the Czech Republic. And I would love to say something very positive and I would like to, <laughs> Uh, talk about all the beautiful steps that we've taken and about our uh, perfectly functioning anti-discrimination legislation. But unfortunately, I would I would probably conclude that we're um, we're in that situation as well. In one word, it's good, and in two words, it's not good. And precisely because we have the same problem, the legislation is not bad, but the implementation is very difficult because there are no 
reinforcement mechanisms that are really effective. And that's uh, precisely what Gio was talking about, was uh, the no competence of the ombudsperson to enforce uh, the, the statements that, that they issue. So that would be the major problem. And the access to justice, that is still a big challenge in our countries as well. Okay, thank you. So let's see what you expect as a next step, or what would be the the ideal scenario. As a non-expert on this issue, I, I would uh, ask, of course, Andre to provide the expert-based answer. But my expectation, as I see it, from because you need to have a broader uh, view, a zoom out in a way, and look at the entire society. Uh, my expectation is that this will not happen very soon, unfortunately, because the culture of tolerance in Moldova is quite low still. Not in terms of, by the way, not in terms of ethnic minorities. When I speak about ethnic minorities, I think that the culture is quite good. There is a good dialogue until it gets to the politics. If it gets to political issue, then there are certain problems. If you are talking about food festivals, dancing, all, all this stuff, and in general, uh, the communication between various ethnic groups. This is, I think, at no, in, indeed, I haven't seen any significant or systemic problem among the among the groups. If we are talking about uh, other types of uh, discrimination, then I think uh, this is going to be a problem for the next decade, maybe. I don't know how long it take will take, but it will take a while until uh, it gets a sort of, uh, uh, it spreads, I mean, the new standard of normalcy, it spreads, it spreads across the country. And also, I think uh, that uh, a very important test would be whether the authorities can uh, increase the, can upgrade, let's say, this anti-discrimination council. Because if we don't see this happening, then we can read this as the lack of interest and lack of uh, uh, yeah, capacity, lack of interest from political will from the side of uh, authorities to uh, really fight this issue. And so far, I don't see this. Maybe I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but as I see it from now, I don't see willingness to push for a greater uh, uh, commitment to, towards the, uh, the issue of really fighting kind of discrimination. We've not campaigns, as, as uh, my colleague here, Georgi, mentioned, but with Filling cases, punishing for uh, discrimination, and so on. I would, I would like to be very optimistic, but I cannot. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm skeptic. I'm realistic. So uh, Jofi asked whether whether the turning point has already arrived, like in Slovakia. So after 10 years of the adoption of the anti-discrimination anti law in 2004, the turning point has not come yet in Slovakia. But you know, this is some kind of like a chemical process. Who would, uh, who would, uh, who would expect that, uh, that the island would adopt, uh, adopt uh, uh, an act on, on civil partnerships like two years ago and they did it, so the most Catholic country in Europe. So, but, but, so sometimes the, the last, the last drop, the last drop in the in, in the in the glass is enough to bring the change, but but so that the last drop can come at a time you have to do a lot of things, <laughs> so that it comes. Uh, so that's that's the only answer that that I can give you. Okay, I just wanted to mention because Georgi mentioned something, and uh, sorry, I don't know your your name, but uh, you you mentioned also uh, something about the moment when it comes, and I think the visualization process, if we get to the uh, subject of uh, this panel, uh, helps uh, helped a lot, Moldova, and I also think that. Uh, the fact that Ukraine and Georgia did not receive the visualization helped them do much better uh, certain things uh, because of the, let's say, because the reward is there still and the EU is still pressuring uh, uh, more to adopt. And I'll tell you my experience in short, when I was working on visualization in Moldova and uh, 
I was willing very much to get to an end this process, of course, and uh, I was always pushing for uh, for uh, like uh, more or less positive reports, and indeed there were grounds, they were impartial, I, I think. But then at the end, uh, I realized that uh, EU is already ready to provide visa liberalization for Moldova, and I realized that there are still left some couple of issues which are not done until the end. And I was then trying to delay, actually, the visa liberalization because that was something that is, uh, uh, how to say, uh, that was putting a lot of pressure on the government to be more uh, uh, faster and more concrete in adopting certain, certain uh, world legislation or implementing certain things. So uh, now for Georgia and for Ukraine, the process maybe is getting more uh, concrete and more tough on the side of the EU, but it's also in the benefit of these countries that they might end up with better regulations, with better implementation of certain, of certain uh, provisions.